I think we should start right now. We have 20 people online at the moment. I'm certain that that number is going to climb. It's already climbing. So welcome, everybody. Uh, I am Neville Swade, and I run the Access Program. For those that don't know, the Access Program is a research uh, and networking program, an education program in climate and earth system science, which is hosted by the CSR and funded by the South African Department of Science and Innovation and um, the National Research Foundation. And um, we have been um, running this series of workshops since last year. Um, um, and uh, we have held three of these events so far. This is the fourth one. And uh, really the goal of all of these is to is to run these headline events designed to spawn further in-depth discussion on a range of related topics to uh, climate change. Um, and uh, as you've seen, we've, we've covered a fair range and we'll be getting into further depth in some of these topics a bit later in the year. The goal is really to get informed about the fundamental elements and broaden transdisciplinary thinking a lot of big events happening, we read them in the news, often at the moment, overwhelmed by COVID. And uh, so we really wanted to put climate change back on the agenda um, and to consider various uh, elements and aspects of climate change. And so that's really what we're doing here. Uh, and then also so we can, you know, cross uh, disciplines um, and, and really enhance the, the networks that we have. So today, uh, these are the topics that we've done, one on, on climate law, one on wildfire. We did one on the biodiversity reports of last year. This week, uh, we are dealing with the cryosphere and, and uh, I think it's next week, we have an event on climate and health. And then we have a couple of other topics we're going to consider. Um, so this week, it's really a, a great pleasure for me to uh, welcome our very prestigious uh, group of, of uh, contributors. Um, Pedro uh, is a colleague of mine, he works at the CSR, he is uh, a, an oceanographer at the CSR, holds the position of Chief Oceanographer at the CSR, um, and runs a, a, a research program there, as well as a network called SOCO, which is the Southern Oceans Carbon and Climate Observatory, and also is the coordinate, coordinating lead author of uh, the IPCC AR6 Working Group 1, Chapter 5 on, carb, on Global Carbon and Other Biogeochemical Cycles and Feedbacks. And um, Helene, who, by the way, is not Helen Chapman, to which I apologize profusely again. I got confused between people I'm dealing with. Uh, Helene is Helene Hewitt, and Pedro will introduce her. Uh, and then we have Dr. Ancha Boetius, who will join us a bit later. So that's really all I'm going to say, and now I'm going to hand the floor to Pedro, who will take us through this event. If you have any comments or chats that you want to, um, to make, please use the chat box for that purpose. Please keep yourself on mute all the time, uh, and we can have some time for, for discussion after Helene has, has given us her input. So Pedro, over to you. Thanks. Thanks very much, Neville. And thanks very much for inviting me to. So first of all, let me do a quick sound check. Can you hear me? Okay, excellent. Um, welcome everyone. And um, to this really important uh, uh, discussion, dialogue around uh, the topic, which is a really important topic in a global sense, but it's actually has quite a low profile in the South African, uh, um, and there I said perhaps beyond that um, landscape of climate, dis climate discussion topics. So the cryosphere, just briefly, so what is it? Um, so so I mean, essentially at its simplest, it's the frozen part of the hydrosphere or the water part of the planet. And uh, it includes the sort of ice sheets, glaciers, ice shelves, sea ice. Um, and 
In the Southern Hemisphere, interestingly, even though it holds from a water volume perspective, the largest part of the cryosphere in Antarctica, um, it actually has, it's not a very well, ex sufficiently well explored topic as much as it is in the Northern Hemisphere. And at one level, it's an easy uh, concept to, and it's uh, relatively easy to understand that. It's just that we lack, lack the land mass in the mid to high latitudes. So for example, Antarctica is separated from Cape Town by 4,000 kilometers of ocean. And, um, and to give you an another perspective on that, Cape Town and Sydney are at about the latitude of Morocco in the Northern Hemisphere. So that kind of gives you the sense of the asymmetry of the relative perception and experience of the cryosphere, which is a much stronger idea in the Northern Hemisphere than it is in the Southern Hemisphere. So, the cryosphere is, I mean, one of the reasons why it's really very wide, it's a major topic of discussion, and our two guests today, I'll introduce them in a minute, are really evidence of how much effort is going into understanding the cryosphere. The cryosphere has many dimensions, and um, it plays, it has an impact in, on the atmosphere, it has an impact in the ocean, it has an impact on land, it shapes major ecosystems globally, and most importantly, it is extremely vulnerable to global warming. And at one level, we don't really understand all the connections that would allow us to predict how it will evolve under global warming. And um, so that's kind of really the, the major effort is kind of understanding cryosphere in the context of the planet and its ecosystems. So the kind of uh, um, questions that one might sort of uh, be thinking about are sort of about the sort of hemispheric contrasts, which I've already referred to. How quickly are they changing as a result of global warming? And what are the long-term, in a sort of decades to centuries, implications of those changes? They could be around climate, they could be around sea level rise, carbon emissions, and ecosystem changes. So today, we have two guests two very distinguished, distinguished guests who spend a significant part of their research time in space thinking about problems to do with the cryosphere from very different perspectives. So Dr. Helene Hewitt from the United, the United Kingdom really comes at it from a sort of physics, physical climate and physical ocean. So the ocean cryosphere and uh, climate uh, nexus, let's call it that. And Professor Anchi Boisius really comes at it from a perspective of the biological implications and in very specific, especially microbiology um, perspective of the cryosphere. And um, so we'll, we'll uh, get to that a little bit later uh, when, when she joins us. So without further ado, I'd like to um, introduce uh, Dr. Helene Hewitt, who's an oceanographer, a modeler in the ocean climate space, and actually also a colleague in the IPCC, a six assessment in the working group one. She's a science fellow at the UK Met Office, and she leads uh, what in the UK is the Joint UK Marine Modeling Program, which is a sort of a joint initiative uh, between the Met Office, NERC, which is the Environment Research Council, the NOC, which is an oceanographic center in Southampton, and the British Antarctic Survey. And 
so these uh, institutions collectively have created uh, a series of developed and uh, set up a series of uh, models and uh, modeling platforms that are available to the community. And it's a kind of an indication of the amount of effort that it takes to put these together, that it's a multi-institutional effort. So um, she's going to be talking to us about the Greenland ice sheet specifically and its changes and its in potential implications for South Africa. So Helene, I pass it pass over to you now. Thanks very much. Thank you, Pedro, for a kind introduction. Um, what I'll do is I'll just share my screen first and then I can talk uh, rather than try and multitask on this. Um, Okay, perhaps Neville can tell me if that looks okay. Yep, it's on its way over. I at the moment have a blank black screen, but I think something's coming. PowerPoint. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, happen, PowerPoint's not happy. <laughs> <laughs> it was all fine when we tested it. Yes, okay, it well, um, while I'm just um, waiting for that to uh, restart, um okay so um i'll just I'll, I'll just talk while that's restarting so um thank you for inviting me so as uh, pedro said uh, uh i work at the met office hadley center i work a lot with um colleagues um in the uk on modeling my background is um originally in oceanography i uh, i did my phd actually on the equatorial pacific uh, but increasingly I've moved out to the polar latitudes, uh, so I've worked on uh, sea ice and now uh, also on ice sheets. I'm the one of the coordinating lead authors of the uh, uh, chapter nine of the uh, sixth assessment report and that covers, uh, so we're assessing their oceans, the cryosphere, so sea ice, ice sheets, permafrost. Um, and also, um, uh, yeah, and, and uh, also sea level as well. Sorry, I'm slightly distracted by trying to set up my computer as well. Try <laughs> and get it going. Try and get the, the PowerPoint going and we'll uh, take it from there. So take your time. Yeah. Um, and so um, uh, Neville asked me to, to give this talk and uh, uh, we agreed that I would I'd, I agreed that I would focus on the Greenland ice sheet. So what I'm going to do is very much a, an overview talk here of the, some of the latest um, research on the Greenland ice sheet um, and trying to put it into context uh, for you. OK, can you yep. see that now? Yep. You've got that. Thanks. OK. So great. Okay, now I can start for a proper. Uh, so, uh, so hopefully I'll cover some of the implications for South Africa. I just wanted to uh, acknowledge Sophie Novicki, who's uh, one of my uh, co-authors on IPCC, and the leader of the ISMIP six project, uh, which I'll talk about, and uh, other people in ISMIP six, particularly Helen Cerisi and uh, Heiko Gulza, who've uh, who, whose uh, slides uh, Sophie has shared with me. So uh, here's a picture of the Greenland ice sheet. And uh, so, so three things that I hope you can take away from, from this uh, short talk is uh, why does what happened in Greenland matter for South Africa? Um, how has the Greenland ice sheet changed recently? And what is the future of the Greenland ice sheet? So uh, this is a schematic, well, I mean, it's a schematic that applies not just to the Greenland ice sheet, but also the, uh, the Antarctic ice sheet. But for now, if you, uh, if you concentrate on the green numbers, those are the ones that uh, really apply to the Greenland ice sheet and the others are for Antarctica. So the um, Greenland ice sheet um, is a, a huge mass of frozen water. 
If it, if it melted instantaneously, it would uh, raise sea, global sea level by about seven, uh, almost seven and a half meters. Uh, between 1991 and 2015, it raised uh, it, it raised sea level by about one centimeter on its own. Uh, so, the, and the main balance in the the Greenland ice sheet is uh, really by between the surface mass balance and the the flux uh, past the grounding lines. Uh, and and so so I thought I'd ask I'd I'd kind of turn it around first and uh, talk first about why the Greenland ice sheet uh, might matter for South Africa, and uh, the reason for the, the the reason why it matters. I mean, I could have written on here that actually it will affect global sea level, uh, so that will affect affect everybody, but in particular for um, South Africa. Uh, what happens when when you lose um, mass uh, from 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 the ice sheets and the glaciers is they have a regional effect on sea level and the the gravitational effects actually mean that closest to the source sea level will go down, whereas away from the source sea will sea level will um, will rise more. So if you look in this uh, figure here, I don't know whether you can see. Can you see my mouse? Hopefully, yes. uh, you can yes. see you can see where I've circled these plots from a, a sea level projections paper by uh, Matt Palmer and co-authors, and they show the the ratio of the uh, local contribution to the far field contribution, and so you can see that that for the Greenland ice sheets, uh, when when uh, ice is is lost to the to the ocean, sea level will actually dip down slightly close to Greenland. But in uh, you know around South Africa and the Southern Ocean, going up into the Pacific, uh, it, it will actually have quite a strong far field effects. Um, and you know you can see that if you compare this with Antarctica, for example, this is um, very different. Where it, so for us in the UK, for example, Antarctica um, might have a smaller effect near Antarctica itself and a much larger effect up to the north. And so if you then look at uh, sea level projections, and in this case, I'm showing them for um, for four locations from from the paper by Matt Palmer. Um, so in this, so Port Louis and Mauritius, Simons Bay, um, which is near Cape Town, I, I believe, um, and uh, Palermo and, and Stanley, uh, which are over the other side of the uh, Atlantic. Then uh, you know you can you can see that out to 2100, uh, we're looking uh, at, at getting up between uh, 0.75 and a meter in the highest projection. So the red line is the RCP 8.5, which is one of the highest projections, and the blue line is RCP 2.6. And you can see that uh, you know for Port Louis and Simon's Bay, they're quite similar. Um, Perhaps a yeah a little lower in the in these other two examples. So so you can see the regional effect there, and more pronounced even when you look out to uh, projections to 2300, when we're looking uh, when it's projecting up to uh, a median of three meters in uh, Cape Town, going up possibly to to five meters even. So there's quite strong effects, and you can you can see this is. Uh, you know, Port Louis and, and Simons Bay are, are much higher than the other two out to 2300. So it is important from a, from a sea level point of view, both globally and regionally. Another uh, reason that you might be concerned about is uh, in the Atlantic, obviously the ocean circulation for people who aren't oceanographers is driven by what we call the Atlantic meridional overturning circulation. So that has pulled strong warm water northwards. It sinks in the northern hemisphere and uh, travels back southwards, and that transports heat northwards throughout the Atlantic. And uh, so, as the Greenland ice sheet um, uh, melts, that will uh, put a, a large amount of fresh water into the North Atlantic, and uh, additional fresh water in the uh, North Atlantic can have the impact of shutting off convection. 
in the uh, the North Atlantic region, and then slowing down the, uh, the the meridional overturning circulation. So if you look in, here's an example of this from a paper by Nick Gollidge and others. Um, and so what they did here was uh, they they allowed well Greenland and Antarctica to melt in different experiments. But if we focus on the Greenland experiment, for example. And you look in the top panel, which is the upper part of the overturning um, in the top few thousand metres of the ocean and which does most of the heat transport um, northwards in the Atlantic. You can see if you look at this, the light blue line, which I'm pointing, pointing to here, you can see that when you uh, when Greenland melts, it has a. Sorry, I didn't mean to press that. Um, it has an impact on the overturning circulation. So you can see here, um, as Greenland melts, it's shutting down the circulation from, uh, you know, 22 sphere drops down to 18 and below. And then later on, it, it's able to recover uh, as it stabilizes. And you can see this impact. I mean, it's very strong in the uh, in the North Atlantic, shutting down the, the circulation, but that's also extending into the Southern Hemisphere as well. So that would have impacts uh, particular in the in the South and the North Atlantic, but also the AMOC has a an effect globally on climate. So how do we think that, or, or how how have we seen the Greenland ice sheet change recently? So uh, these are results from a, a paper by the the IMBI team, which was published last year. Uh, so IMBI is a project which aims to reconcile estimates from from a number of different sources um, measuring the ice sheet so from satellite altimetry the gravimetry and the input output math method um, and uh, and these are put together for a, a consolidated estimate and so what you can see is you can you can see in the dark blue the total loss um, of mass from the ice sheet from the 1990s to the present day you can, if you look at the green line, you can see that in the 1990s, the surface mass balance was uh, was approximately close to zero, and that uh, since about uh, you know 2005 onwards, that's uh, that has declined, and uh, prior to that, there's been decline of the ice sheet from the from the dynamics. Uh, so at the moment, it, it appears there's a contribution from both effects. But as the ice sheet shrinks away from the outlet, uh, away from the coast, the contribution from the outlet glaciers will reduce much, much more, and uh, there'll be there'll be more melting uh, and runoff there. So here's a um, what I want to show you here is a um, this is a figure, and I'm going to just quickly show you the video if it works, uh, which was produced from NASA, and you can see the evolution of the the ice sheet from uh, 2003 onwards. Um, you can see there's a seasonal cycle, but you can see this large decline. And what you see is that um, around 2012, it moves to cooler conditions, so there's less ice loss. And this doesn't quite continue to 2019, but I'll, uh, you'll see in a minute from the other picture that it picks up again then. So, Hopefully this is going to work now. It did work when we... Uh, and we both. It did work in our trial. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, well, that's... Uh, so I'll just uh, say, so uh, here's a plot which is showing, uh, this is to show the, the, the interannual variation. You can see uh, this is the, the mass loss on the axis here. Uh, and okay, it's going to work. Great. Okay, so here, this is a video, and you can see in the circle here, it's showing you we're tracking the the total loss, and the map is showing you uh, where that loss has occurred. So you can see now as we're moving into the uh, the, the late two thousands, large loss at the around the coast, particularly in the uh, southern and uh, western regions. And that's really intensifying as you get down to uh, 2016. I'll just show you that once more. So here you can see it 
gradually building up in that south southwestern area near where there's uh, glacier outflows and it's intensifying as it goes through so that you can see that strong seasonal cycle you can see as we come up to a, a large loss around 2012 and then you, you can see it slow down a little as we move to warmer atmospheric conditions. Um, that was on the slide I wanted. Okay, and, um, and so if you look in the top panel, uh, you, you can see how this varies from, from year to year. You can see uh, the loss in 2012 was very large. Uh, much, uh, you, you know, intermediate in 2010 and 2011. Uh, then after 2012, much less loss generally until 2019 when it reached the uh, 2000, uh, almost the, the uh, 2010 levels. So uh, you can see that interannual variability there. And this is strongly linked to, uh, to atmospheric circulation, uh, you know, the clouds uh, in particular as well. So, so there, there is that, that strong variability there. Uh, this is another recent paper which was produced, which came out recently uh, in Nature uh, by Kahn and co-authors. And in this, they look, they really focused on three of the glaciers, which they were able to look at right back to the 1880s, uh, looking at uh, various sources, including uh, photographic images of it. And so uh, you can see as you look through. So it goes in this direction across and then down and across. Uh, you, you can see that there was retreat in the early periods. Uh, but that retreat, uh, you know, has particularly sped up uh, recently. And you can see that here, if you look, this is the same um, glacier here. Uh, you know, while, while there was some, some loss through the, the century, there's been a lot of loss in the uh, very recent periods. Uh, you know, uh, looking like uh, it's it's some sense perhaps of accelerating um, and true also here. So these three glaciers alone contributed about eight millimetres to sea level rise um, between 1880 and 2012. And it's projected that uh, they could contribute um, maybe even, you know, nine to 26 millimetres by 2100. Uh, so if you sum that up over uh, large areas, uh, that will add up to a lot. So that moves me on nicely to projections. So uh, this is a, uh, an, a nice summary that uh, Sophie put together of um, how we uh, thought, how IPCC thought about ice sheets and sea level rise. So in the first assessment report, the view was that there was no major dynamic response of the ice sheets expected during the 21st century and that thermal expansion and uh, the melting of the glaciers would be the main contributor to the sea level rise. Or we know everything about ice sheets. And then in, by the time we got to the fourth assessment report, uh, they were saying that understanding of these effects is too limited to assess their likelihood and they couldn't provide a best estimate or even an upper bound for the sea level rise. So basically we know nothing. And then by the time we got to the fifth assessment report in 2013, uh, they noted there that there was improved modelling of the land ice contribution, but that significant uncertainties remain, particularly related to the magnitude and rate of the ice sheet contribution for the 21st century and beyond. So basically, uh, you know, we know something about the future of ice sheets, but really not enough. So uh, other work that people have done recently, the IMB team and a follow up paper by Slater and co-authors uh, looked at how uh, the ice sheet uh, uh, contributions from IMB compared to the those projected from the AR5. So what you're seeing here is the the blue line shows the fifth percentile of the um, ice sheet projections from the AR5. The orange is the median and the red is the upper part. 
And so you can see that the IMB data appears to have been tracking the, the upper edge of the uh, projections in the, uh, the fifth assessment report. Uh, you know, whereas you probably would have expected it to track much more closely to the median. Um, and if you look then at the contributions, um, you can then see that uh, the surface mass balance here, you can see the Greenland surface mass balance, the median of that from for, or the, the central estimate from IMBI is outside the upper range there of the uh, AR5 projections, uh, whereas the dynamics is is much more is much closer to the median. So uh, th this perhaps fits with the, pi the picture that we've seen earlier, the, 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 the fact that atmospheric conditions could be playing an important role with the circulation and the clouds. And so that brings us to uh, how we move on from the AR5 perspective. And so uh, <clears throat> um, in the uh, sixth assessment report, there has been a big push on the uh, CMIP-6, uh, the Climate Model Intercomparison Project. And ISMIP-6 is one of those. So that stands for the Ice Sheet Model Intercomparison Project. And its goal is to estimate the future sea level contributions from both the Greenland and the Antarctic ice sheets and the associated uncertainties. And they have a framework where the forcings are taken from climate models taking part in CMIP-6. And uh, then these are used to force uh, standalone ice sheet models. But there are also some mo coupled models that interactively include ice sheets. And so then you can explore the impact of forcings, the impact of feedbacks and the impact of the projections um, so, so which scenario, for example? And so, uh, so, so what what was uh, done in in CMIP, in ISMIP six for Greenland was that a selection of the CMIP six models were chosen to try and encompass a whole range of of models um, and and futures. So uh, the, this shows you um, mostly us. Well, these are the bottom lines are all RCP 8.5, so a high emission scenario, and they chose one low emission scenario for comparison. And uh, and these were also used for the ocean forcing, and uh, it gives projected retreat of uh, of the uh, ice sheets. And you can see, obviously, it's much higher with 8.5 than 2.6. Uh, this is this slide is really to sh to kind of emphasize the huge amount of effort which goes into these uh, these models. So there was a, a series of experiments. So so 10 experiments and, and three extra experiments which were run with a range of different forcings. And each of these were applied to the different uh, uh, ice sheet models. Uh, so you can see there's a whole range of ice sheet models. They have different types of dynamics included, different types of initialization. Um, th there is a range in the initial years that were chosen and a range also of resolution. So some very high resolution ice sheet models, some much lower ones. So the lowest is uh, 16 kilometers and, and high, the highest can be, uh, you know, really sub kilometer in places. So this is a, um, a slide showing the comparison from uh, the, from one model at 8.5. And you can see that all the ice sheet models, this is the different ice sheet standalone models simulating that scenario. And it gives a, a large range in the projections, well, a fairly large range. Though. They all project they're going to lose ice. Um, and you can see that uh, the ensemble mean uh, is showing the loss around the edge, but the standard deviation is also still quite quite large across that uh, those scenarios. And so this was done for the different models and uh, also for the 2.6 scenario. So you can see the 8.5 scenarios all show show large loss, less so for 2.6. So that is what we would expect. But it does vary a lot across the uh, the forcing models, and uh, the 
uh, relative to an unforced control experiment and that's um, that's quite important because there's some loss already locked in but uh, from the initial conditions the uh, 2.6 model projects something like 32 millimeters across the ensemble whereas the 8.5 is projecting about 90 plus or minus 50 millimeters across these six GCMs. And then you, um, you know, that in uh, the ISMIP six community, they've then looked at where the uh, how much variation you get due to the climate forcing, which is quite a lot, and also quite regional, uh, particularly in uh, in the southern areas and the uh, central west as well. Um, and uh, there's also uncertainty associated with the ocean forcing. Um, which is also regionally dependent how much depending on how much that area um, is influenced by the ocean so those are these mip6 projections um, and then there are other projections which have been done uh, this is by uh, andy ashvanden and and co-authors and this is a very high resolution model of uh, of Greenland and they actually ran this out to uh, 3,000 years so in these um, I, th I think I'm um, I'm trying to remember now because I put the figure in I think this is um, 2300 and oh, no, perhaps it's year 3000 and you can see very high losses at in 8.5 and much lower in the the lower emission scenarios um, and here is another video by from NASA which hopefully will work and you can see how that uh, then evolves so you can see in this this is just a very short video but you can see at this uh, very high resolution uh, the ice loss um, at 8.5 moving very fast along this um, particularly in this central west and southwest coast here so if you see it again you can see these are uh, these of um, these outlet glaciers here and, and uh, you know compared to where we were in AR5 you see ice sheet modeling has advanced uh, dramatically in that time and so this um, this is this is probably viewed as quite a sensitive model. Um, it's 8.5 scenarios projects uh, a loss of up to about 33 centimeters from Greenland by 2100. So um, they, you know, um, it's it's perhaps could be viewed as a slightly more upper bound estimate. Um, and the, the the final thing I just wanted to touch on is the question about whether ice loss can be reversed uh, from Greenland. And so uh, there's a, an older paper here by um, Jeff Ridley, one of my colleagues at the, the Hadley Centre. Um, and in this paper, um, they looked at, uh, at, uh, at, at the ice loss and then trying to recover it. And so you see here that as time, go, time uh, continues, this is the ice loss. And if they stop at a particular point, will the will the ice recover or not so this is the fraction of the initial ice sheet volume so you can see that you get to a point and um, before this point you can get back to a recovery of the ice sheet but once you've gone past the threshold you're you seem no longer to be able to get some um, back uh, to, to your original ice sheet volume and this is um here's another paper by jonathan gregory uh, also a colleague at the um, Met Office um, and uh, in, in this paper they, they ran the ice sheet model under different temperatures so the warmer temperatures are the, the darker colours and then they at the points where it moves to black you, re you um, reset to the 20th century climate and uh, you can see that in uh, in some of these, the earlier ones, before it's past this threshold line, you, you've you lost ice, but then the ice um, the ice will then regrow. This is the ice regrowing because it's the effect on sea level this is uh, shown as. Whereas uh, once you've passed this threshold and you've contributed, uh, say, you know, six or seven metres uh, or, or or past three and a half meters in this case to uh, sea level 
the ice sheet can regrow, but not back to its original level. So it seems to, uh, to, to reach some kind of maximum level where it's committed to about two metres of sea level already. <coughs> So, um, so in both cases, there appears to be a sign of this threshold, and that's true in other papers uh, as well. So, so really, uh, you know, to, to summarise, the, the Greenland ice sheet is melting. So since 1993, it's contributed about a centimetre to global sea level compared for the, the total change. The Greenland mass loss uh, was um, tracking the high end of the IPCC AR5 projections with indications of uh, that there was a role of the atmospheric forcing. There are um, there will be estimates from ISMIP6 in, in AR6, uh, but you know, I'm just saying here what the upper end is. So, you know, an upper end estimate uh, could be. 33 centimetres, although we know that's a very highly sensitive model. So, um, uh, you know, you can caveat that. SROC um, suggested, uh, I think it was closer to 20 centimetres for the Greenland ice sheet for the high end. And uh, that's out of a total sea level of up to about uh, just over a metre by 2100. There's definite indication that a threshold exists, either in temperature or size, beyond which the ice sheet can't regrow. And um, I talked at the beginning of the talk about how it might affect South Africa through the impact on the global and regional sea level and uh, the freshwater effect on the uh, meridional overturning circulation. And very happy to take any questions. Thanks very much, Lean. Thanks for that. That was a really, really interesting and thought-provoking um, set of ideas around this, and it's it's um, and it's we've already got a number of um, questions. Um, I just want to ask uh, Neville, what what is the sort of time? What are the time constraints on the questions? Thanks, Pedro. Well, um, uh, we are waiting for Anja Bottius to join us. I don't see her yet online, so we can at least continue until she does join us, um, and perhaps a bit beyond that. And if we do have questions left over, I will undertake to record a question and answer session with Helene when and if that suits her. But in the meantime, let's progress to some of these questions. Would you like? Them, Pedro, or do you want to read them? So I, I've got them, thanks. Okay, great. So, so I think that just generally one of the sort of take home, high level take home messages here is that we, we really do have to pay attention A to the cryosphere and perhaps pay more attention to it from as a, as a sort of science community in this part of the world, but B we have to pay attention to what uh, is being done in the Arctic around um, these questions around the cryosphere, just because those signals propagate to our hemisphere, either through the ocean or through the atmosphere. So, and how it does that is something that we need to have a, a clearer understanding and the capacity to project those. those. So Eileen, those are, uh, so we've got a number of questions here, and uh, there are two which are really part of the same uh, thought. And um, and the the question is really how is ice loss rec uh, um, recorded? How do you determine ice loss? <laughs> um. There's various different ways, but the, the, the obvious way is from the, you know, from the satellite altimetry. I mean, you, you can see the, 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 they can measure the height of the, the elevation of the ice sheet. So that's one way. Um, and, uh, you, you know, you can, the, the, it's, it's the, the different methods they use in the, um, in the INBI data. So, you know, that's, that's one way from satellites. Um, yeah. So, yeah, 
Re read the details in the IMBI paper, <laughs> but that is the, that is the obvious way. So thanks, thanks. Um, so I've got a question associated with that. Is that in terms of sea level, the contributions that the ice sheets and ice shelves make to sea level rise? How do you tell the northern hemisphere contribution from a southern hemisphere contribution? Is it just by measuring the loss through that same way and is looking at the loss from the satellite observations? Yes, yeah. Okay. Yes. Right. So there's another question here, which is that you've really focused on, um, although you did show a number of different scenarios, a sort of a, a, a high, medium, and low mitigation, there was a sort of a, this question saying, well, you were focusing largely on the results from RCP 8.5, but that, that seems like an unlikely scenario. Um, is, uh, is, is there a reason for that? Yes, well, I'm I'm not on the ISMIP 6 committee, so I I wouldn't know, I don't know exactly why they, they focused on ICP 8.5. Obviously, I guess one reason is there's a long a lead time on these experiments and uh, this discussion about RCP 8.5 being unlikely, probably the ISMIP 6 projections probably predated that is one thing. Another is, I, you know, we are limited in the number of experiments we can do. And, and so um, RCP 8.5 will give you the biggest signal and be able to understand better the sensitivity between the different forcings. Um, so um, I definitely would take that point, and I'll, um, I'll 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 feed that I'll feed that back to Sophie and others, and ask them what they're thinking for um, for an ISMIP follow-on. Great. Um, there was a question about um, are we are we in a period in which glaciers are forming more slowly, or are they melting faster? Um, oh, that's a good question, isn't it? Yeah, well, I, th I think that I think they're melting faster, basically, at the moment. I mean, that's not true of all glaciers. I mean, glaciers regionally is a very complicated, complicated uh, topic. So I don't think you can say something. Um, you know, I, I think you would say globally glaciers, um, you know, both mountain glaciers and the peripheral glaciers are, are melting, but there can be, you know, re very strong regional differences where some glaciers will buck the trend, if you like. So uh, you have to you have to look at individual ones, and you have to some, you know, make the global sum. I think as well. Here's another one which is kind of along that line as well. Um, so, so how did ice sheets grow in the first place if they need to be beyond that threshold that you were talking about to regrow? Well, I, yeah, <laughs> I, well, I mean, I guess the, the ice sheets that we're seeing now are, you know, the, the product of, of paleo history, if you like. I mean, you, you can still see that they uh, relate quite strongly to global temperature um you know the, the, or, well or polar temperature so um i guess ultimately they must go past the threshold but i hadn't really again people ask questions and it's things you hadn't really thought about so um i i guess it gets cold enough that it that it gets that it gets beyond that threshold I, I have um, one additional question for you. So, so ice sheets, ice shelves, and sea ice, I kind of think about them as a, in this sort of a continuum. I probably shouldn't think about them as a continuum, but anyway, that's... Uh, um, is there a feedback between them? You know, in other words, do changes in the sea ice alter the dynamics of the ice shelves and the, um, and the ice sheets? And vice versa, and, you know, and can... Uh, uh, the ice shelves and ice sheets influence the dynamics of the sea ice? Yeah, I mean, I think people talk about this more in the southern hemisphere around Antarctica. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's it perhaps, 
yeah, I, I think it's probably possibly less true in Greenland, but in Antarctica, there's a lot of work on looking at the interactions of the sea ice and how much that buttresses the ice shells and stops the outflow from the from the ice sheet. So there it is believed there's a, you know, there, there is an interaction between the two. And that is a that is definitely an active topic of research. Right. Pedro, uh, to interrupt by saying there are maybe some other questions and Helena will come back to you about recording a, a quick exchange with you uh, on some of the questions and answers that might remain. Um, thank you. Yeah, great. You're welcome. Thank you very much, Helene. That, that was great. Thank you very much. Okay, so I see that Anchi Borisius has joined us and um, a warm welcome to you, Anchi. And, um, and without further ado, let me introduce you and um, open the floor for you. So Anchi is our second distinguished guest today. And um, as I mentioned earlier, she comes at this uh, cryosphere uh, issue from a completely different perspective, but um, in fact, um, from the perspective of um, the ecology and, and the processes around the microbiological communities associated with the cryosphere. Of course, she also thinks much more broadly than that about the sort of large scale implications, etc. But uh, Anchi is a, a microbiologist with a sort of ocean focus more broadly. She's probably better, um, uh, has a sort of a, lo a longer history in deep ocean uh, microbiology and more recently has uh, taken an interest in the um, cryosphere dimension of, um, uh, of the, uh, of the micro microbiological biomes. So she, uh, Anchi is a professor of geomicrobiology at, at uh, University of Bremen in association with the Max Planck Institute. She's also the director of the of what's generally called AVI, it's the Alfred Wegener Institute, which is the premier German center for polar research and a more recent association with Geomar in, in Kiel with uh, um, an Arctic um, focus around the ecological effects of warming and sea ice melting. She has, she has earned an enormous number of awards and I'm not going to list them all as simply to say that a good metric of that is that for the past 12 years she's won at least one international or national award. <laughs> so, but most recently and she was also the co-lead uh, scientist for the mosaic experiment. And that's, I think, is going to be really the focus of her engagement with us today. And I mean, the mosaic experiment was really an audacious idea that, and it was audacious both intellectually and logistically. And I'm sure we'll hear a little bit about it. And it's, it's actually gives, gives one a sense of at what scale do we need to plan our understanding of these processes when you're thinking about the links that really explain the variability and the long-term trends that these systems are going through. And the mosaic experiment was really a seasonal cycle experiment. And, uh, and it provided uh, unique uh, synchronicity in observations from physics to ecosystem. And I think that, that was certainly one of the things that we, you know, that was really uh, fascinating about it. So the topic of her presentation is into the ice, the coupling of climate, sea ice, ecosystem states in the Arctic. Anchi, over to you. Thank you very much. And uh, hello to everyone here. I'm very happy to be with you and uh, to discuss a little bit of everything that Petru has just mentioned <laughs> and still aiming for uh, finishing the job in time. So let's start. Um, I hope you will see in a moment the screen. 
Is that yes. good? Can you yes. see it? Excellent. Yes, thank you. Okay. So um, I would like to discuss a bit more about the cryosphere, cryosphere changes and the relevance for life on Earth, including us humans. And um, I'm also happy to say a few words about uh, Mosaic, our latest uh, large mission, but also in general, as Beto mentioned, this whole question of how important is it to observe, to study, to analyze processes and their connection to our human behavior. So what I'm so fascinated with, or always was since I'm a kid, is actually what does the cryosphere and the deep oceans mean for planet Earth and, uh, and life on Earth? And so I love this picture, this depiction of Earth when you cut it in half and you see on the one hand the Arctic and on the other hand the Antarctic and you see they are really different systems, though they represent our polar regions. The Arctic is basically a deep ocean, an ocean that is linked to the Atlantic and also to the Pacific and is covered with sea ice, has a continent covered with ice masses, Greenland, but much smaller ice masses in total than Antarctica. And the Arctic has this huge area of frozen ground called permafrost that you see here in pinkish. That's an area where in the old days, so to say, in the Holocene, um, Earth was permanently frozen and covered by snow. And when you look to the Antarctic, then you see it's a continent here in um, the South Pole is uh, in the middle of a mountain range, basically. You have two to three kilometers ice, ice mass um, that uh, has built up, as you've just discussed before me. And um, then you have the sea ice around the continent Antarctica. And you see the Southern Ocean, which is this vast, huge, deep ocean that connects all oceans together with the circumpolar current. So two very, very different systems. And one of the most interesting questions of, uh, of the geosphere and the history of Earth is really how did these two polar regions actually function together in shielding the Earth from warming, warming by, their, by their whiteness? So today we still struggle to answer the lead and lag functions of both polar regions, like when Earth got closer to Sun and started warming, how did these two polar regions uh, respond on which timescales? Those are all very important questions. But the, the difference between the, the both has always also been a struggle for the public to understand, is there really global change? Is there global warming? So here, I love the sea ice indicators. Here you see again from our sea ice portal that we host at AVI together with the University of Bremen, just the extent of the sea ice in the Arctic from 79 to 2020. And that's the October mean. And uh, before, like let's say the, the last 20 years, we've always used the September mean because that was the time of the sea ice minimum in the Arctic. But uh, now it's October actually, so it's delayed to autumn. And there you see what, what uh, is so striking to understand that the sea ice is shrinking with a very clear trend of meanwhile 13% per decade. And you can see that in the last few years, there have been these huge, for example, 2012, but also later now this year, there have been really a rapid decline again. And, and when you look at the trend and the current trend, it might well be that in the next five years, we will have to adjust the statistic trend for sea ice loss. Then below here, you see Antarctica, the sea ice of Antarctica. And this time it's the May, so it's the opposite six months uh, um, reflection of the season. And you get the impression that sea ice is actually increasing, but it has a, a huge dynamic in the, in the recent years. And for some years, it has been also shrinking a little bit, then now inclining again. But one of the big struggles uh, with the public and with the media to make people understand that global change is real has always been this argument. How can you say that sea ice is shrinking when it's actually growing in Antarctica? Two very different systems. We need to understand both of them, but today I'm going to focus on the Arctic, which has this enormous amplification of uh, sea ice loss and warming. So why they are so different, we can explain scientifically. It's not just one factor, it's many factors all together, but when you see the global distribution of temperature change between the, the 70s to today, you see what we mean by Arctic amplification, the north is warming a lot and very rapidly. In Antarctica, A, we've just said there is this, this, the ice mass on the continent. So when you measure 
ground temperature is already very high and it's very cold. Plus you have the circumpolar current that actually protects the ice masses and the sea ice. So it's the same, or it's sometimes even a bit colder in some areas, but there are entire areas of Antarctica where sea ice is also shrinking. Like where we work in Antarctica, parts of the Weddell Sea, we see that, but uh, in Western Antarctica. So it is so that we really have to understand there is a regional variation, a regional difference that we have to look at. In the Arctic, however, sea ice is shrinking everywhere because of this very rapid warming. Um, and I come back to this temperature differences uh, um, in, a, in a moment. Myself, I, as a deep sea researcher and geomicrobiologist, as I was introduced, I always thought much more about being able to look under the ice, discovering all kinds of new life forms that no one knows about, when by chance, uh, after doing my PhD in the Arctic in 93, going with the sea ice uh, uh, breaker polar stern to the Siberian seas and the seas around Spitsbergen that were fully ice covered with multi-year thick sea ice at the time. And then coming back in 2012, where I was expedition leader and being there in the summer where the sea ice melted at the most dramatic rate we know since the onset of satellite observations. And so that has really changed the way I looked at sea ice because I was there and I literally saw with my own eyes and all the expedition members too, what it actually means when sea ice is melting so fast and all the life in the ice and on the ice loses their habitat. It's, it's a striking process. So one of our senior polar researchers, uh, Markus Rex, he's a very calm uh, physicist, but when he saw that rapid ice uh, shrinking, he said, he wrote to the media and said to the media, I saw when the ice was dying. Of course, ice is not dying, <laughs> but still the impression of that rapid melt is just amazing when you see it with your own eyes. Here you see a glimpse of what I've just talked about. I don't know how many of you have been to the ice, have seen sea ice, but these years, these summers, this is what the North Pole looks like. And so even if you have never seen sea ice or walked on it, when you look at this ice surface here, when you see how the icebreaker is now steaming through the ice as if it was butter, so just a very porous, thin sea ice, less than a meter left in summertime, everything covered with melt ponds, huge cracks and leads to which the ships can go. And in fact, also drilling an ice core just takes like one hand now. And in a few centimeters, basically, you see the warming ocean waters coming up through the ice, melting it from below and above. Then you understand what it means that ice is rapidly melting from warming of the atmosphere and warming of the oceans. So this state, the Antarctic has not reached yet, but that's the Arctic state. And from Earth history, we know it can be times when the Arctic looks like that. Eventually, it will get to the Antarctic. With the Arctic, which is so different because it is surrounded by pan-Arctic states. In fact, civilization is relatively near to the Arctic. The Arctic is a giant shelf sea um, and has, uh, has a deep sea in the middle, basically still we fail in giving it enough attention. All of that change that I've just described merely from the perspective of sea ice. This map that you see here in red was is the area where we have uh, sea ice or had sea ice in the past hundred years. The dots that you see are those places where we have observations, long-term observations of, of ecological parameters, sometimes only phytoplankton, sometimes a bit more. But you see our problem. As human civilization, we have barely any long-term time series in the inner Arctic Ocean. Uh, we have barely any stable long-term time series in huge parts of the Asian continents. And also in the North American ones, we have some, but there are whole areas where we just have no observations. So we really have still a big data gap in the Arctic, even more so in the Antarctic. So when I started uh, becoming uh, more and more focused on polar research and the Arctic change, Arctic amplification, I wrote several proposals to have a large project funded to be able to observe the Arctic year round from the sea ice surface to the vast water column, mind that the deep Arctic Ocean is on average above four kilometers deep to the seafloor. So I really wanted to be able to observe, even when the ship is not there, changes in the ice and how would they be reflected in the water column and also on the seafloor. Because from deep sea ecology, I know that the deep sea life that 
live so deep in a dark, cold ocean where it depends on the surface-borne nutrition, the surface-borne algal growth. There is no way that plants can live down in a deep ocean. So whatever food is like at the surface, this is the food of which a little bit will get to the deep sea. And that's how deep sea organisms are coupled to the surface oceans. So I wanted to be able for the first time to have year-round observations of changes in the sea ice and their potential impact on deep sea life. This we can only afford, and even Germany, which is a rich country, which has long-term stable research funding for observations, these uh, coupled sea ice, uh, deep ocean, ocean seafloor observatories with modern sensors that can last for one or two years are immensely expensive. And we just have this one observatory approach um, to the Arctic and uh, will struggle also in the future to maintain it. So the first thing we need to understand when sea ice is shrinking, when it develops these melt ponds or when it just has these leads and, and gets thinner and thinner, one of the changes that will occur to the sea ice and the ocean life beneath is the reflection of the sunlight will decrease. There will be more sunlight penetrating through the sea ice and to the oceans. We know from our measurements at the AVI that between the time when I was a PhD student in uh, 1992 to 1996, sea ice was much thicker than it is today. It's several, it was several meters thickness on average uh, at that time when I was a PhD student. Today, it is um, one and a half meters maybe. So that shrinking thickness means more sunlight into the oceans and you would per se say, okay, that might be an advantage to ocean productivity. If there's more sunlight getting to the oceans, there will be more phytoplankton growing. Eventually there's more food also for the fish, for the polar bears. It could actually be a favorable story for the Arctic ecosystem. However, that was exactly the question of our research. What effect will more sunlight have on the local populations in the Arctic? So you have to know that the life in the sea ice is very specific. It is adapted to the sea ice. And uh, the, when you take an ice core, as you see here, and you see that brown layer here at the bottom of the ice core, that's where the sea ice diatoms sit. Um, that's, those are phytoplankton, the specific types of phytoplanktons. And the amazing thing is what you find in the sea ice is different from what you find in the ocean. And so sea ice communities are highly adapted to the sea ice. They develop proteins and they develop all kinds of enzymes and other things that make them stick to the ice. They actually shape the pores of the ice. They live in symbiosis with certain bacteria and other critters. And so that was one of the issues and our hypothesis in the studies. If the multi-year ice, the thick ice is shrinking away and not growing back again, that might already be a, a dramatic change in sea ice species. And, and that's what we found. But I will not talk so much about this today. I will try to connect you from the ocean surface to the deep sea. So the question that we had was, if there is this rapid melt and if the ocean is warming from below, then it is likely that we might lose this active productive layer of diatoms that sit at the bottom of the sea ice core in contact to the ocean to get to the nutrients because nutrients are fastly depleted in the Arctic. When ice melts and the rivers from the continents come in, you always have the situation that the Arctic surface water is very fresh and sits on top of the warmer Atlantic water. You have to understand that sea ice, when you look from it from below, and that's true for Antarctica as well as for Arctica, sea ice is actually like a reverse seafloor. It is full of life, really. And the way that the phytoplankton, unicellular organisms, tend to form these mats, which are then a habitat and food and an area to hide for crustaceans and larvae of fish and, and all kinds of life, then you understand that, of course, it matters if sea ice is there, if it's thick or thin and so on. And in fact, when you have these observations, you also understand how tightly adapted all kinds of, uh, of animals are to manage to feed from the under ice life. Note that in both oceans, Antarctica and the Arctica, a lot of the ice, the sea ice adapted life is actually gelatinous jellyfish life, like you see here. And this one is really hard to get to. You cannot catch it simply by nets because it's like jelly. It will fall apart in, in pieces. And when you, you have to use robots or divers to actually observe 
the immensity, the diversity of sea ice adapted life that feeds from that phytoplankton growth. Now imagine that sea ice goes away, sea ice is melting away, and then it is clear that that will change, of course, food webs. And that's, that was the second part of our studies in the, in the recent years. We wanted to know exactly that. When the sea ice is shrinking and melting, is there maybe a balance because thinner ice means more productivity? Or if the sea ice goes away, does it actually mean less productivity because you do not have the normal food webs that you usually have in the Arctic? For that, we needed to put up traps in the oceans to catch what falls from the ice to be able to know how is actually the export from the primary productivity, the feeding of animals down to the deep sea. So for that, we use sediment traps. Sediment traps really are traps. They are like these big funnel shaped cylinders that you moor, that you anchor in the oceans. And then whatever falls, they have standardized sizes, whatever falls from the ice from the ocean surface, maybe to depths at 100 and 200 meters or down to the seafloor, is caught in rotating and revolving bottles. And then you know for each month, here you can see the difference between the months. You can see, for example, in summertime, there is much more stuff caught than in wintertime, of course, because in summertime there's light and primary production, in wintertime no light, but still some stuff falls from the ice into the deep sea. So we did these observations and you can imagine that it's really hard to anchor such moorings in the ice and get them back from the ice, but we've managed to do a kind of a time series with time and we were able to see that yes, there is an increase of productivity and an increase in the amount of uh, carbon of export of phytoplankton detritus from the, the surface from the ice into those traps. And we also saw that on the seafloor. What you see here in this graph is a comparison of my PhD studies data in 93 to the mission I was on in 2012. And you see plant pigments. We call them chloroplastic pigment equivalents. That just means the, the pigments that, that algae produce to catch sunlight, chlorophyll. And you can see when you compare the red bars that in most water depths of the Arctic, in fact, the amount of plant pigments that are exported to the seafloor have increased, speaking, so confirming the hypothesis that thinning sea ice will allow for more productivity. But what we were really surprised to find when we used cameras to the ocean floor in 2012 was that it wasn't all about the small rain of marine snow of small phytoplankton detritus, but actually on the seafloor around the sea, uh, the North Pole at 4,400 meters water depth, here we are catching some of the sediments, you see these greenish whitish dots here. And these larger blobs of material are actually the, the decaying big sea ice algal mats that I showed you before from under the ice. So what we observed was that when ice is melting away, basically it's not only the normal export of a little bit of detritus that is left, but basically everything that lives in the ice when the ice melts away falls to the deep sea. So a completely different nutrition of deep sea organisms. And it was really amazing to see that many of the deep sea life weren't even able to use that new food source because they were not adapted to eating gelatinous mats. We found a few sea cucumbers, a, a few um, ophiurids, so starfish that could eat from it. But we are just at the beginning of potentially seeing a transition into a whole new deep sea ecosystem in the Arctic. We saw more. For example, what we're seeing in recent years is the poleward migration of species because European waters in the Atlantic are becoming so warm that the cod, so fish that we fish uh, also for industrial commercial purposes, have to migrate to colder waters to reproduce. So the Atlantic cod has moved up quite far into the Arctic and in fact from the few surveys that we took us with ocean robots and cameras, we saw the haddock and we saw the Atlantic cod reaching really far up almost to the North Pole. We don't know if they reproduced there yet, but we can see that that's what we call Atlantification, that with the warming of the Atlantic waters, with the shift of the climate zones, we'll get a whole migration of organisms. And that together with what I've just reported about the food web, that will probably change everything in the future. And there's even more. When in the past 10 years, we were alerted by our camera pictures from the ocean and the seafloor. We found out that the Arctic 
the way that it changes, the way that snow, precipitation, sea ice formation, sea ice melting and access to the Arctic by ship changes, that of course we were also able to see with our observatory uh, a rapid increase in plastification. You might be surprised that I call it that, but in fact, today we know that in all ocean regions, we have an accumulation of plastic particles from human civilization. Some of it is far range transport, some of it is local transport, but we were able to show with our observatory from the atmosphere, sea ice to ocean and deep sea life that already now in these times, there is a huge accumulation of microplastics, so plastic particles as big as maybe a few millimeters or smaller. They come through the atmosphere with snow, they rain down on sea ice. When the sea ice melts, they are exported to the seawater, to the deep sea sediments. And in fact, the sea ice is actually focusing and concentrating those particles so that we really have high numbers in the Arctic deep sea sediment. In Antarctica, we have been beginning to study this. We are not so sure yet uh, because the distances to continents is of course far greater. Also, where the sea ice recedes, we get an increase in macroplastics. So the remnants of civilization, be it fishery nets, be it plastic bags, be it all kinds of disposable items. Here you see our time series observation from the Atlantic, uh, deep water access to the Arctic. In the recent years, there is a huge increase in large plastics. And actually where you see that the sea ice is receding, where more tourist boats and fisher boats go, we have this increase of large plastics. I will now come to the story of mosaic. Um, now that I've told you a bit about my own research and trying to get year round uh, spatial and temporal synchronous observations with long term observation connecting ice to the seafloor. Um, in 2011, a wild group of uh, atmospheric researchers came together worldwide to propose one unique mission to the planet, basically to, to science. And that was to go and have their ships frozen in for an entire year. Just as Fridtjof Nansen, the Norwegian, uh, did, uh, he did it actually for three years, which is wooden ship, the farm, uh, some 125 years ago. So the Arctic, as I said before, is a very remote ocean and covered with ice. In winter, it is very cold and dark. And at, uh, when the atmospheric scientists proposed that expedition, people were interested but thought it's impossible to do such a thing because you have to exchange people, you cannot keep them for a year. And uh, it, it was deemed a great idea, but unlikely that it could happen. But eventually, with the no knowledge of Arctic change and Arctic amplification, enough support got together that the Mosaic mission actually took place. And they returned last year in October. And I'm very proud to say that we've managed, the Abi was the coordinator of that mission, that we've managed even to carry on expeditions throughout the entire pandemic. What did Nansen want at his times? You see him here sitting, uh, smoking and thinking, and he was actually the one oceanographer that showed that sea ice is drifting, that there is no continent in the Arctic, it's just an ocean with ice on top. And also he wanted to show how deep the Arctic is, but he didn't have enough rope. He also wanted to show that um, how cold it can be. He forced other physicians to calibrate the thermometer so that they could really determine how cold it can be. Hence, we have his data for a comparison. So this was a fantastic mission that he did. He wrote great books about it. And, uh, but uh, we were the ones challenged by this idea that we would manage it with our polar research icebreakers. Mind that some other people have managed to stay in the Arctic for a year on a sailing boat doing some research. Others stayed there with the research expedition closer to the shelf, the famous Shiva expedition. And the brave Russians were able to actually camp out for many years out in the Arctic drifting on an ice floe. But since a few years, this is no longer maintained because the ice has gotten too thin. So how did we do that expedition and what did we want to see? Um, it was a mission that brought together 450 scientists and crew throughout the year. And uh, the, the scientists came from more than 20 nations. It was really an international experiment. There were PhD students, there were scientists of all ages and disciplines together. And um, I don't have uh, so much time to show you a lot of the uh, 
uh, eyewitness reports, but I would like to show you one small video clip that explains once more what methodologies were brought together to be able to do a synchronous year round measurements. So I'll be quiet now for three minutes <laughs> and please enjoy this little clip that should explain to you the technologies of the mosaic mission. The Arctic, the northernmost region on Earth, cold, remote. Even here, the extent of global warming can clearly be seen. The Arctic ice is rapidly thawing, with dramatic consequences for our climate. In order to better understand the climate processes in the Arctic, we need to take measurements year round. To reach the central Arctic in winter, the Polarstern must freeze herself in the ice and take the natural ice drift all the way through the Arctic Ocean. This is the Mosaic Expedition. Under the direction of the Alfred Wegener Institute, scientists from all over the world are working together and have set up a research camp on the ice. This includes an ROV city, where researchers use remotely operated vehicles, ROVs, to collect observational data under the ice and transmit it back to the surface. There's also an ocean city, where the experts lower measuring equipment through holes in the ice and haul water samples to the surface. There is an ice research camp where researchers study and observe the sea ice and snow cover. There is a Met City and Balloon Town where the researchers collect data on the atmosphere and air composition. Up to 50 kilometers around the central observatory, several dozen ice monitoring stations have been installed. They drift with the camp, autonomously recording and transmitting measurement data along the way. Additionally, aircraft augment the study of the ice, atmosphere and clouds by taking measurements from the air. Icebreakers from international partners are available to exchange scientists and crew as needed. The overall structure, the Polarstern, research camp and surrounding measuring stations will all drift through the Arctic for an entire year, collecting valuable data. This data will be vital to understanding the Arctic climate and how it will impact the rest of the world. So exactly that, um, that those are the last few minutes of my talk now before we will discuss. Exactly that was the great uh, part of the mission that is not ended just because the expedition has ended, but now you have to imagine all of those researchers are back with their observations, measurements, and we were able to have for this year synchronous measurements from as uh, high up uh, as, as uh, 30 kilometers in the air and as deep as four kilometers, so almost full bottom range. And we need to put from all disciplines that we had, uh, so ecosystem, physics, atmosphere, sea, ice, oceans, everything together um, so that we can answer this urgent questions. How can we better predict how the warming in the Arctic will develop and how the sea ice will develop? Um, it is uh, quite dramatic when you look at the range of projected warming. So I just heard the end of your discussion and you just discussed uncertainties. How, how will there better be better knowledge, better prognosis of the question of future ice mass loss and this exact question we have for the Arctic. Not many people know 
that with the um, RCP 8.5 scenario, so business as usual scenario, we'll have this quite um, inquieting problem knowing how the Arctic will change. We always discuss like two, three, four degree warming, global warming, but in the Arctic, as you can see here on that uh, graph, the uncertainty is much, much higher due to the amplification effects. So by various effects, it might well be that what we currently would think is a four degrees increase in Arctic warming might end up to be a 10 or 12 or 14 degrees increase in warming. And that uncertainty is of course dramatic for the cryosphere because it could mean, and there are self-perpetuating uh, uh, feedback cycles when it comes to ice, it could mean that we are losing sea ice uh, much earlier than we are considering. And then there is also the big scientific question of what does it change the way, does it change the way we live? So what does it mean if the North Pole changes of sea ice is lost? What does it mean to the rest of the world? Those questions were tackled in various ways by Mosaic, um, just to say what we already observed comparing the temperature measurements of Fridtjof Nansen 125 years ago to today, we were really struck to find out that the North Pole uh, region has warmed already by 10 degrees comparing the winter of uh, Nansen's expedition to the winter that we witnessed. So normally there is no meteorological station and no observations except from a few drifting buoys because there are no ships in winter time. And you see this to, to even make people understand that while we all know how dramatic planet Earth is changing in many areas, we have no observations, we are blind. And so in that regard, I'm hoping much that this mission will change the way we understand the Arctic, but we need to connect everything, atmosphere, ice, oceans, and life. And that is still a, um, a mission for years to come to bring all data together to be able to change also the algorithms with which we do the climate modeling. What I also wanted to discuss is the what is currently in the media a lot in Germany because we had this weird uh, um, end of the winter where just a week ago I was uh, ice skating at uh, minus 20 degrees and now that I'm speaking to you it is plus 17 degrees outside. So we have just in Germany, and that happens now all around the world in the northern continent, we have these effects of the very dramatic shifts in um, the stability of the jet stream, the polar vortex and the jet stream. What does it actually mean? It means that, and that's the hypothesis that we are analyzing also with those data. When we have sea ice present the way we had for the past 10,000 years, we have a relatively stable polar vortex that you see here on this little depiction on the Earth. And then you have a relatively stable jet stream um, and both are stabilized by temperature gradients and of course by many other physical factors. But once the temperature gradient decreases and there is this idea that sea ice is part of that problem, shrinking sea ice, the jet stream, the polar vortex can get weaker and that can lead to the meandering of the jet stream, causing situations as I've just described, that in one week you have this cold North Pole air coming down to the continents, and in the next week you have the warm African air coming up to the continents. We just had amazing pictures this winter. I don't know if, if you saw the snow in Madrid, now the, the terror in Texas with the snowstorms. And so these, these risks that we have they might well be connected to the Arctic amplification. It's still hard to prove that in evidence with the models we have, but there are so many factors that we have not well depicted yet that we think that all of that knowledge, the, the, the value of putting all the knowledge together is of course better prognosis for such situations. There is also the self-perpetuation, the reinforcing feedback loops that I've mentioned. For example, there is uh, research out there that says the loss of the Arctic's reflective sea ice will advance global warming by much more than we have considered, than we are considering today when we are having this prognosis of warming in our regions. And many more. I, can, I don't have enough time to list you all of those feedback loops um, that we think uh, that are out there and that are connected to our lives. Um, note that for those reasons, sea ice, Arctic sea ice is considered a tipping point in the Earth system. Now, I'll end with this outlook of how, how will sea ice develop? Exactly that is one worrying point that the current uh, uh, CMIP-6 models that we have 
um, the, the simulations that you have here for the ice mass are strikingly different. So some of the models predict currently that uh, there could be ice-free summers um, as soon as uh, the, the 2050s. We have new models even that predict the first ice-free summer could be there in 2030. Some say, no, it will never be ice-free. So this uncertainty means a lot to life in the Arctic, but also to people living in the Arctic, to businesses in the Arctic and all of that. That's really our big goal that we will much be much better in predicting the physical world and hence we will probably also better understand the biological world and also us. But, and that's what I'm going to end with, despite all the knowledge that we have connected for both polar regions um, that we can connect and uh, despite all that we know already how rapid the planet is changing, we see that CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere are ever increasing and mostly due to continuous human emission, human uses of fossil fuels. So some people have expected that we can see the effect of the corona pandemics on uh, the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere, but we can see it in total emissions, total global emissions. They have dropped by 7% or so, but we are not seeing that yet in the atmosphere um, for questions of slow mixing rates, but also because there are so many processes out there in nature where warming of Earth means there will be an enhanced CO2 emission also from from nature itself, from the from forests, from all kinds of processes, uh, and that's worrying news. Note that when this picture was drawn in 2018, where humanity crossed for the first time in winter time 409, 410 parts per million, so really a range that has not been present on Earth since the Holocene we have now crossed uh, uh, 415 parts per, per million. And uh, this is once again a reminder that knowing our history, we are completely outside of the range of nearby uh, geological processes, geological knowledge we have on Earth. As you can see here on this uh, graph that takes you back 800,000 years. In that time, you see Earth's natural variation um, with CO2 in the atmosphere um, that have to do with angles to the sun and so on. But you see that us humans have completely changed the way that, uh, that we live today, the climate warming that we see today. It is not natural by whatever means. So the big question is, what does it mean for the cryosphere? I like this graph and this investigation of the global carbon budget and the future of CO2 in the atmosphere. And it is directly co connected to that future of the cryosphere, both in Arctic and Antarctica. What you see here is along a timeline of our human behavior, basically. You see here above the zero line in yellow and, and gray, land use change and fossil carbon usage. And you can see that we have much increased in the past years, the emissions uh, from fossil carbon uses more than from land use change. And you have to understand that nature is of course helping us in some way. The ocean takes up CO2 by biological processes that I've mentioned, but also by physical uh, solubility of CO2 in water. Plants and trees take up CO2 and to make wood from it that might be partially buried or lasts a long time. But the problem is if we are emitting more than nature can take up ocean and land, the rest will all go to the atmosphere. And the way we are dealing with it right now with our atmosphere economically is like it would be a cost-free cost -free litter deposit of some kind. And that creates the huge problems that we have. And the unfair bit of all of that is that it's not globally equally distributed which countries put how much carbon in the atmosphere. And so the changes that we have ahead of us, they really have to do with the way that humanity will behave in the future and the international cooperation we can undertake to prevent further strong emissions of CO2. We know for the Arctic that there is an almost direct link between CO2 emissions and uh, sea ice decline. And uh, here you see in this uh, slide once more the depiction of the path we could be on as humanity. The red one is the one that we've discussed now in the presentations as the business as usual. We are just continuing to grow and to produce and to have economies as we always had. And the blue is the one that we would hope we could take to protect some of the sea ice in the Arctic. It's the path that would lead to a global warming that could be just under two degrees Celsius. And you see what it demands from humanity. It demands that now 2020 to 21, we should 
totally manage CO2 emissions in a way that they will be strongly declining to carbon neutrality in 2050. So that's what we need to work on. And that's why all of that knowledge and the eye on the cryosphere is so important. The cryosphere is our key indicator for changes on Earth, climate changes on Earth. And we need those, those data to monitor how we behave as humans. With this, I would end. Thank you for your attention. And I'm looking forward to the questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Antje. That was really inspiring. Um, so there are a couple of questions. Um, and so let, let me uh, just focus on the latest ones. Um, so the one question is an intriguing one. From what you've learned, but, um, what, what, do, you, do you have any insight about what would be the impact of um, to the deep sea ecosystem in the Arctic, presumably, when there is in fact no sea ice available? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, so the, there are several publications out there that suggest that when sea ice shrinks, there will be even more sunlight and that means more phytoplankton production, that means more energy, more nutrition to deep sea life. But there is a problem with this assumption and that is the stratification of the Arctic Ocean. So we know that in Earth history, the Arctic Ocean has become immensely stratified, almost a freshwater lake or sometimes a full freshwater lake because it gets so much precipitation and, and also river input. And, and that leads to a thin, less dense uh, freshwater surface layer on top of the salty warm Atlantic layer. And so once you have that stratification going on and we can measure it already, there is almost no nutrient mixing. And so what we are waiting for, if eventually the predicted increased waves and storms will kick in in the Arctic so that there would be nutrient mixing, because if you don't have mixing, if you have this very strict stratification, the, the idea that there will be more primary production is not uh, realistic. So in some areas of the Arctic, we see that effect already. We actually have so little nitrate as a nutrient in the Arctic that we can have only a tiny bit of phytoplankton production. And the sea ice, when you think about it, for the phytoplankton mats that I've shown to you, the sea ice has sometimes a function like a transport means or like a bus. So the algae that get grow on the sea ice that are get shuffled around by the wind, they will always have access to more nutrients from that mixing of the sea ice. So they might be really critical in the nutrition of the life in the Arctic and deep sea. And that's exactly what we're researching. My prediction is that on the Arctic shelf areas, there will be more food and more life in the future, but that the central basins will probably have a problem in having enough energy in the future. Fascinating. So there's uh, another question, which is a very contemporary one. Did you notice, was there any, uh, uh, did COVID, the lockdown, have an effect on the sea ice, um, the rate at which the sea ice was melting? In other words, was there a, a direct effect between the sort of the reduction in emissions and, and uh, no, the, the uh, emission reductions were far too small to have an effect on the, the system as such. So the global carbon reduction, it's not fully calculated yet what the second and third waves that many countries saw, what effect that had. But we, are, we have probably saved us some 7 or 8% of global emissions per, for a year now. And seven to eight percent is just not enough to, to really change the climate system as such. It is a contribution. So you could say uh, on the long run, uh, it matters also for sea ice extent in the Arctic, but it is not an effect that we can directly measure. In fact, we had the fastest sea ice melt ever last summer in, in the middle of the, the lockdown because of the, the highly warmed atmosphere, the warm north. I don't know if you read about this, but Siberia had heat waves where it became 30 degrees plus in Siberia. Okay, so one very last question. Um, 
because we're sort of running over time and I'm also cognizant of your, yours and Helene's time. Um, if we were to follow RCP, I mean, uh, SSP 1.1, um, how long would it take for the Ar Arctic system to recover? Oh, that's an excellent question. So um, we have a big debate about this because uh, when it is cold enough, so when we have a normal, when we have the Arctic winter, the polar night, it can become very cold. So it, it also during mosaic, they observed uh, minus 40, minus 42 degrees Celsius. And that's physics. So sea ice will build back when there is a cold winter, when there's the next cold winter and the summers are not too warm. Uh, the prediction is that within 10 years, we could have 10 to 20 years, we could have thick multi-year ice back. But for that to have cold summers, we need a completely different planet uh, or a, a different progression. So we, the, the sea ice physicists that I asked the same question as biologists, they told me it probably needs some mitigation. There are crazy ideas like, uh, for example, pumping ocean water onto the ice flows that they are better protected in the future or other things like, like that. Uh, it could need a couple of decades if we would be really coming, uh, managing uh, just the plus 1.5 degree average warming. It, it still could take decades for the system to, to fall back into what we know, what we, what we knew as PhD students. But that's all very unlikely to happen. So most CS physicists say that our generation will see the first summerly ice-free Arctic. Well, on that, I'd like to thank you both very much for really both, both really inspiring presentations. They come at a good time for us, you know, because we, we are rapidly expanding our um, um, Antarctic, Southern Ocean research from the physics through to the biology and the, of course with the climate context. And, um, and particularly sort of the links with, with our colleagues at the University of Cape Town and ourselves. So I kind of see, why not, a joint RV uh, South African expedition, uh, uh, over a year-long expedition in the Weddell Sea linked to an Australian, <laughs> Australian, New Zealand and US one in the Ross Sea, why not? That would be okay, fantastic. We'll just leave it at that. And um, thank you very much, both of you, once again. And, um, and take care and um, yeah. You're welcome. And I heard South Africa will have a polar research institute, a national polar research institute. So oh, that's good news. We didn't know that. Yeah, I, I got an email and I wrote a letter of support. Uh, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Pedro knows all about that. <laughs> they know. <laughs> so that's excellent. And um, yeah, that is, of course, um, important to exchange and uh, so important to watch out for Antarctica and the way it will change there and the regionality and all of that. So yeah, we should stay connected. <laughs> yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Antje and Pedro. I know Helene had to leave already. Uh, we're going to close right now. I just want to advertise our next event, which is going to be about climate and health, which will take place on the 2nd of March. And uh, yeah, it was an excellent afternoon really grateful for all of your participation and Pedro for your excellent chairing and contribution. So we're going to leave it there and wish you all uh, thanks and good night. Good night. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Take bye -bye. care. Bye-bye.